being here, both students, faculty, staff, and our esteemed admissions law school or law school faculty folk. Um, we really appreciate it. My name is Katie Dean Moore. I work here in the FSU Career Center, and I'm one of the coordinators for pre-law advising here at FSU. Holly Hunt is the other. Um, and we're just so thankful that you could come. We are filming for distance learning students today, so she'll be, um, Katie will be taking um, video of some of your answers to questions that students ask. We're going to open it up um, with just an introduction of who you are, what school you represent, um, and maybe a little bit about your school that you think students should know or might have questions about um, briefly. And then um, we'll have students just ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question or you are the type of person that doesn't like raising your hand, that's why we have papers in your chairs. Just write that question down um, and then kind of hold up your paper and Holly and I will ask it on your behalf. We're happy to do that. Um, <coughs> The other thing is we do have a class of about 20 students who's joining us around 3.30, so they'll just kind of filter in, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but don't be alarmed if you see people being late. Um, <laughs> and if you need to leave to use the restroom or whatever, this is this will be informal. So uh, I hope it'll just be a great, engaging conversation um, where you all can get some of your questions answered. And, and you all might have questions, too, of our FSU students. So um, we'll start, I guess, on the end down there. Down here in the hinterlands. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is John Washington. I'm the assistant dean of admission at the FAMU College of Law, which is located in Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, we're a fairly new school, been around about uh, 15 years this time, and, and we're happy to be here with that. Uh, my name is Chris Carbo. I am the director of recruitment at FIU Law in Miami. From time to time, I also teach on an adjunct basis in the law school and in the political science department um, in response to the question I get most often, what sets FIU apart? I'd say flexibility is, is the biggest thing. Uh, being a very small law school, um, the dean knows who you are, which could be a good or a bad thing for some of you, but it, it's, it's nearly impossible to get lost, which is great because you have a lot of opportunities to let them Hello everyone, my name is Deborah Gautier. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions Recruiting here at the Florida State University College of Law. Um, I won't say too much because hopefully you know more about our law school than maybe other law schools here. But how many people have been to officially visit the College of Law about a mile that away? Not enough hands. So there's a link on our website to schedule a visit. You can sit in on a class, you can get a tour with a student ambassador, and I highly encourage you to do that. Right. Right. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say. Hi, I'm Bill Perez, Assistant Dean for Admissions at Get Ready for This Nova Southeastern University Shepherd Brown College of Law. The longest name on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Fort Lauderdale, uh, which is I'm um, so we're surprised when I leave Southeast Florida. Uh, we're on the east side of Florida, 20 miles north of Miami. <laughs> uh, uh, our school's been around for about 40 years. Signature programs with the Health Law, International Law, and Trial Advocacy, and we're also uh, introducing a whole curriculum uh, for summer immersion in the area of the business of law. So, how to make law practice successful. Hello, everyone. My name is Carmen Johnson. I'm the Assistant Director for Admissions and Diversity Admissions at Stetson University College of Law. Stetson is located down in Tampa Bay, Florida, and um, uh, is the oldest law school in Florida. So we were the first ones here. <laughs> Founded in 1900. We take a lot of pride in it. And so thank you for coming to the panel. I hope you all enjoy the information we give you. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Lucena. I am actually an SU alum. I graduated in 2006 and then I went back home to Broward County and I attended law school at St. Thomas University School of Law. We're located in Miami Gardens, Florida, which is approximately 30 minutes from each beach. So Fort Lauderdale Beach or Miami Beach. <laughs> um, I never left, so clearly I liked it. Uh, what sets us apart, I really think, is the familial atmosphere. Everybody's friendly, really small, uh, much different than Florida State for me. Uh, the dean knew my name. Thankfully, it was a good thing this time. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm the 
My name is Lomar Castro. I'm the Director of Admissions at the Eleven College of Law at the University of Florida. And we're the second oldest law school. <laughs> one of the things I like about this school is that it has a very diversified curriculum, so you could create multiple concentrations, and then we have certain areas that we have created certificate programs, but it gives a lot of flexibility to our students to do different things. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcy Cox, and I am the Dean of Career Development um, at the University of Miami School of Law. So I don't really know very much about admissions, admittedly, um, but I have worked at the university, at the law school for almost for 18 years, so I know enough. Um, <laughs> I know enough about the school. Anyway, um, you know, in thinking about the University of Miami, I think um, what makes it a great place to go to school, the first thing I think of is diversity, diversity of student body, diversity of the faculty, um, the diversity of the location. Um, and um, the, the school has a host of offerings. We have eight LLM programs, we have a number of joint degree programs, um, we have programs in arts and entertainment, business, international, envir environmental science, um, health and medicine, public affairs, and um, so I think that um, when you try to identify strength, it's hard to do, to do so um, because our, stu our, our students have an, an opportunity to, to study and, um, and obtain careers in pretty much anything they want to do. So with that, um, my first question is, what are you most excited to see from FSU students? I'm sure you all have seen FSU students on your campuses. So what, what kind of gets you excited about our folks? And then I'll open it up to, to student questions. Don't have to go in order. And um, I've been at uh, FAMU for three years. And each year, FSU is a um, probably the second or third highest number of applications originally from Florida State University. And the, the thing that excites me about seeing those applications are students who are um, well prepared in terms of having researched what um, our school's uh, particular emphasis is. Um, they are uh, pretty well cognizant of where they fit along the continuum in terms of your LSAT and GPA, how those numbers rank you in, in terms of likely acceptance to our school. And, um, and, and the other thing uh, I will mention is the, um, the quality of the essays. They're typically um, are fairly well written and responsive to the question. So those are things that I um, appreciate and look forward to seeing in uh, FSU student applications. Um, to chime in on that, it's something that I always find interesting about this is, is the maturity level. It's sort of interesting. A lot of folks are from Miami, come up here for school for four years, want to go back to Miami uh, to go to law school and actually live and practice in South Florida. Um, and the four years away do, does them a world of good. Um, you know, just their worldview, their perspective, their plan of what they want to do is very different than some of the folks that we see um, from a lot of local schools, including FIU, including our own students who are also great. Um, but the focus and, and the growth of the four years of being in Tallahassee, being in the state's capital, uh, really shows through when you know, they come visit, when they sit in on the class, uh, personal statements, all those things. Hey, is that anyone who want to stay three more years? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've been in this position for seven years now, and I've seen really, from a merit perspective, the quality of FSU applications rise each year. Um, you know, FSU has gone from being our second or third feeder institution to our number one feeder institution here at Florida State. So a lot of people will ask, you know, do I have an easier time getting in because I went to Florida State for undergrad? That is not the case. If you're good enough to get in, you're good enough to get in, and that's just continually, continually rising in the last few years, and I project that to continue. Our tenure my, my first reaction or an answer to the question 
I was a blind, obsessive love in the university. Um, that's what strikes me. Uh, and uh, each time I visit, yeah, I, I, I get it. Uh, but uh, a slightly different version of, of what Chris said from, from FIE, and that is just, just confidence and sense of direction. I can usually tell uh, a no when I need them because uh, he or she is very clear about why this is the next step and uh, regarding law school as just a step. They're more often than not very clear on what's coming after law school and what's coming after that first job and what's coming after that. Uh, on our campus, I know some of our more successful students while they're still in school are uh, those who graduated from Florida State. And the only thing I would add, I would agree with everyone about every, uh, everything that everyone said so far, but the only thing I, I, that I would add is when I speak with Stetson students, or uh, FSU students in regards to coming to Stetson. Um, a lot of uh, FSU students were interested in Stetson. They've been able to experience FSU and all the glory, football, everything. And then when they come to Stetson, they're able to really get down to that smaller campus. A lot of campuses are smaller, the law school's up here. But when we're engaging with them, they've been able to experience the larger school atmosphere, and now they're ready to engage with that smaller school. And some of the benefits of being at a smaller school, perhaps, where you get that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So a lot of the FSU students, some of the students as well, have been able to experience that, and now they kind of know how to facilitate that small school atmosphere, and they're looking forward to it. So I actually really engage that conversation because they're really able to appreciate what Stetson has to offer, even though they thoroughly enjoy their FSU experience. <laughs> um, and, and definitely, they're so proud of it, and they seriously walk around campus with their garden gold. <laughs> I, I have a student ambassador. We've got maybe 10 student ambassadors in the office. And one of them wears three days a week. Some sort of that. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> when I come across the Florida State application, absolutely, I'm first like, oh yeah, that's this person. <laughs> but um, honestly, the work ethic, it speaks for itself. I know what went into your all's education. So, um, you know, it, it stands out and I can see it and see some of the classes. And then I love meeting with Florida State students, especially criminology majors, because like, did you have Daniel Mayer Kat in? Yeah, his glasses came off. And you just have this sense of, sense of nostalgia that comes back. And I absolutely have this blind love for my university. At FSU undergrad, you have both, of, both worlds. Because you have that alumni base that is just huge across the state of Florida and outside of the state of Florida. So I think that's something to consider. Um, going to the law school is important, but then when you leave the law school, what are you going to have in terms of networking power? And I think that's what we are able to do combined. I think the, the panel um, the panelists have, have said it all. So I would just reiterate, um, I'm always pleased. I love the school spirit. I went to an undergraduate school. We had great school spirit. And um, so I love the school spirit. Um, I think that translates into enthusiasm for learning, and um, so I appreciate that, the professionalism and the willingness to work hard. Does anybody, any of the students have questions or staff? We don't bite unless you ask. You look like you're thinking. I am trying. I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> Is this just open up to general questions? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Um, I just want to thank everyone because I know all you all were standing outside in the, in the sun. I had a lot of classes earlier, so I was going like, to make it out. I couldn't really make it out. Um, so, what is the biggest mistake that I can make applying to your law school so that I don't do it? <laughs> putting, another, putting another school's name in your program. <laughs> okay. That happens more often. Yeah. Not reading the instructions. 
that's because and it happens a lot because you are doing so many applications, you feel everybody's asking the same thing, but we're not, and then you send us exactly what we don't want. And we know what school you were trying to submit the application because we know what the other schools are looking for. And it's like, oh, they really were trying for stats and not for us because of the information you provide. So read the instructions very carefully. Um, we put a lot of time and effort in creating the instructions because we want specific things. So that's like the biggest thing. Make sure you read the instructions and provide each school what they're looking for. I know like those minute details, mm -hmm. like addressing the proper university, are things that are going to make or break you as an attorney. You know, that attention to detail is absolutely going to um, make sure you're either successful or not in the career. So. And I, I've seen judges throw away applications for internships and clerkships because of the time. Yeah, and emphasizing the proofreading. Yeah. Just proofread everything. A lot of people don't think to proofread the resume for some reason. Um, maybe because they feel it's a list. Proofread everything. everything. I would say something that um, you might not think about in your law school experience that could impact you later on would be uh, candor. And the reason is because once you graduate and apply for the bar, then they're going to get your law school application and they're going to conduct a thorough investigation. So if you left something off that you thought you'd slide past the law school because we're not investigating, okay. um, the bar will see it, and that's when you get called to a hearing for, uh, and, and get kept out for a lack of candor. So I would say um, answer the questions, read the questions as have been stated, but answer them honestly and thoroughly because you don't want to be in a situation where you are not admitted because the investigation is taking so long because they found discrepancies between your bar application and your law school application. So. What kind of discrepancies do you usually see? Well, for example, in our application we ask for any um, encounters with law enforcement or tickets over $200, right? And so, and so let's say you're like a little speed demon, right? <laughs> and, um, and you didn't include, you know, there's, there's there's like 15 speeding tickets, and you thought that was a little bit much, and you didn't want to disclose that to law school, so you kind of summarize by giving the top three. <laughs> right? Right? So that, that creates that creates a, a candor issue. So, um, so it depends on the question, the specific question of the application, that you answer that honestly and thoroughly. And I think the advice is, if in doubt, disclose. Right. Mm -hmm. I would say, and that, I think that's great, great advice, and um, definitely with regard to the Florida Bar, we see when students um, are trying to gain admission that they have problems, but we also see it when students are, you know, just even after the first year, it's, it's tough to get a job, you know, because nowadays everyone does it, you know, back in the old days, we do, you know, there were some agencies, government agencies that did a, a background check, but now everyone has access to that information. And even law firms um, will sometimes do background checks for, in, for, for, for students that are, are gonna work there. Um, and that leads me to, to another, another point. Um, social media, with regard to any type of so social media page, even stuff that you think is fun, like you guys maybe were at the game, and you, were, you and your buddies were, you know, had beers, and you, were, you, know, you had your arms around each other, and, in your context right now, it looks fine. In a professional context, not maybe not so. So I think 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 very very carefully what's on your social media pages, and it's not enough just to say oh it's private because somebody has access to it, and that person might share some of it. Okay. Thank you. What stands out most in applications for you guys besides the deals? Personal statement. Did you say what what stands yeah, out the most? Statement. Yeah, personal statement, and then everyone else can chime in. But personal statement really gives the insight um, about you as an applicant beyond the numbers. Yes, you're right. The LSAT is so so important. Um, but beyond that, the personal statement really gives us some some idea about your passion, um, about kind of what you're about, and, and really gives an, an idea about your writing style as well, your ability to write. Any applicant who's engaging and genuine at the same time in his or her presentation. And that means not just the, the application, 
or the personal statement, but it comes through in the resume to an extent in terms of uh, expanding on what you do when you're not studying, and if you're really smart and strategic, uh, what your recommenders are saying about you. Uh, but if you leave me wanting to read more, <laughs> mm -hmm. or make me want to pick up the phone and call you, even though I know you won't answer because you don't know my number, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's a good thing. And, and there are people who do that every year. They don't always come to my school, but they get my attention and I remember them forever. It always stands out to me um, if you have sort of a mentor or somebody that you mention in your personal statement, and then seeing that person's letter of recommendation. So if you mention somebody that was like a god to you and they were fantastic, and then there's not a letter of recommendation, sometimes I'm a little disappointed. I guess what stands out to me are um, inconsistencies. Um, a student who scores very well on the LSAT and has a marginal GPA, for as an example, right? Um, uh, things that just kind of don't add up. This, this, there's something missing in the picture about this student. The student's that bright, but but they didn't get it done in the full year. Those kind of things, I think that um, just head scratchers. Um, you want to try and address in your personal statement or in the something to try and tie it all together because if, if I'm questioning, uh, chances are the law professors who are admissions committee members are also questioning. So um, try and answer, you know, the obvious things, things that just doesn't look like they don't matter. I would say max, maximize what we allow you to submit. Um, and that goes back to reading interactions uh, very thoroughly. But you know, some of us will allow for a diversity statement in addition to a personal statement that will allow you to kind of round out your application in a nice way where you're not regurgitating the same information in your personal statement, in your diversity statement, on your resume. In particular, in regards to the resume, um, I've been very high on encouraging people recently to think about this as more, this is not like you're applying for a job, and this is not what our career uh, placement liaisons will tell you to do once you get into law school, but um, utilize this space as more of an accomplishment, skills learned resume instead of, it's great if you've got some legal experience. Is it gonna make or break your application? Probably not, um, but just answering the phone and filing paperwork doesn't really tell me how that experience impacted you, and you can use the resume to, to add a little bit more information there if you don't have enough space to talk about this in your personal statement or your diversity statement. So really kind of maximizing your sales opportunity to the committee. One thing when you are approaching this process, you're gonna be interacting with so many different people at the law school. Be very careful how you treat them because the person that answers the phone has sometimes the same kind of power than the person that is reading the statement and your application. And sometimes people treat very shabby the people that are the support staff in the office, thinking, oh, they're not, they're not gonna even remember me. Guess what? I just got a phone call from so-and-so and they tell us about that phone call. And that stays in our mind, because remember one of the things we're doing, we're looking at your academy, but also we're looking whether you'd be a good fit in our community. So that's something that weighs into the decision. So be very careful, everybody that you approach, be very nice, polite, because you never know if that person is gonna pass some kind of information to that person that is gonna make the ultimate decision. Email included. Just in reference to reputation and social media, uh, it starts now. So you guys are thinking about law school and you want to be attorneys. Your reputation and um, how you treat people is really always going to come full circle. And these are not just your peers anymore that you're in high school or undergrad with. Now these are your colleagues. So now these are people that are going to be referring cases and things of that nature. So I really just encourage you to be kind. Mm -hmm. Remember that you're going to professional school. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's grad school, yes, but it's even a step beyond grad school, professional school. You should emphasize the professional. Kind of piggybacking, I'm about to get on my soapbox. <laughs> Do not text, type an email or letter to anyone, anywhere affiliated with any law school. Use appropriate capitalization.
education, from tuition, address us as Dean so and so, Sir or Madam, Miss Miss Gautier. You know, um, we're not your buddies hanging out at football games at the bar on Friday night. And a lot of people will send emails. And the most of those emails get uploaded into your files, so the committee members are seeing that extraneous correspondence. So keep that in mind. And just because someone is is nice to you and friendly, um, I have students that say all the time, "But you're so nice to me." I'm like, "What did you? What was that you just sent me?" And uh, they'll say, "Oh, but you know, I thought we were buds." Really? <laughs> no, no. It, it's it, and listen. Even if I am bud. If, 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 if I am, in fact, my best friend is coming to speak at the law school. She's an alum. I sent letters to everyone, giving them all of the information. And the letter that I sent her was this, it was as formal as the letters that I sent to the people I'd never met. I didn't send her an email saying, hey, see you on Wednesday, 12 30, every piece of information. So just because someone is nice, just because they're, they, they laugh with you and spend some time talking to you, that does not mean that it's okay to be informal. So that advice is really good. If I have to Google an acronym, that's <laughs> not okay. <laughs> 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 FW, I got FWIW the other day. And I what is that? For what it's worth. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 pre-law students, but you know, what, can you tell us some examples of a difference between the personal statement and diversity statement? Like how students, because you mentioned like maximizing everything that's allowed for submission. So what would be some good things of, you know, between the two, like how would they be maximizing those or writing those? I'll probably a little bit different on that. Read the directions. I'll handle it since I mentioned it. Um, you know, for us, I, we allow 500 words for your personal statement. And I think we're very general our prompts so you really could write about anything but I think it's what makes sense why you're here why you walk where are you going how are you a good fit you can't say all that 500 words so you pick out part of that and tell us about it um, and then with the diversity statement what makes you unique what makes you special what are you going to bring to a classroom setting that no other person may be bringing to us at Florida State we don't have a diversity statement at FIU at all um, but you can weave that into your personal statement, and in fact, um, we changed your application this year to increase the length of your personal statement. Uh, we get about 2,000 applications a year for about 140, 150 students, so one of the things we most closely look at is, what do you bring to the conversation? What do you bring to the table? Um, why will the person next to you in the contracts first year be like, wow, OMG. <laughs> I'm glad that this person is next to me, you know, and, and, and that, you know, what might be in a diversity statement at another institution might play into that, um, any sort of life experience, any professional experience, or anything like that. Um, so we allow you to sort of weave them together in the same piece and expand it the length in which we allow you to do that. Um, but what we want to know is just what do you bring to the table that's going to enrich this <clears throat> I think along those lines, it's important to point out that um, you're not getting admitted by your word count, right? If they said 500 words, then use that as a hard limit. They'll go beyond that. Uh, but don't feel like you got to have 500 words just because that's what the limit is if you really only have 473 good ones, right? Stop there. Um, and so uh, with the diversity statement, it's an opportunity. Uh, for example, we ask some very specific questions that are geared to information that we want to see because we're concerned about um, matriculating students who are interested in giving back and, and helping in the community. So our prompts in the personal statement are geared towards community service because that's what we're looking for. And diversity would be um, an opportunity to provide something that doesn't uh, leap off the page, like um, uh, an experience that, that you had growing up that really shaped your, your heart for helping the disadvantaged, right? That might be an opportunity to speak to an issue that's also important to us. 
Um, but don't feel like you got to write it because you have this opportunity to do so. By all means, if you have something to say, expand. Use that as an opportunity to expand our uh, understanding of who you are as an individual. But, but don't feel like you, you got to just because we say three pages um, that you should put three pages. I believe that the application process, the way it is, you have certain amount to talk about yourself. So any opportunity you have to talk, like the rest said, more about yourself is better. Because otherwise, I always think about it like you're looking through a window, and the window is this big. And I'm just seeing just that little bit of information. But the more information you provide, the window opens more wider. And then I can see you more fully. So when you have an opportunity to do a diversity statement, take advantage of it. Like for us, we want to know what are you bringing to our community, pretty general. Talk about the things that you have done and what makes you so special and so cool that you will fit in our community, because that's what we want to hear. But don't disregard those opportunities, because then they're just giving me a little bit, and then I have to make my basic decision based on that little bit when you have so much more to offer, so take advantage of it. St. Thomas Law does not require a diversity statement, although um, you may upload one if you're so inclined. I would say uh, use it to your best advantage if there's uh, absolutely something that shaped you in your life as far as giving back to the community. Uh, we're big on that, but also um, maybe something in your life that maybe caused a disadvantage. Uh, you weren't able to possibly pay for an LSAT prep course, and while you may have only gotten a mediocre marginal score, Things like that, we want to know that, um, you know, because really that, that's a huge difference. Somebody that gets to take a prep course versus someone that doesn't, that speaks volumes to me. I mean, I jumped 10 points, you know, for the prep course. So those types of things, absolutely. Let us know those things. We're not going to know otherwise, you know. Um, also, uh, let us know if you had a rough start in undergrad or somewhere, right? You messed up along the lines. And then point us in the right direction. Say, well, I realize that my... Uh, undergraduate GPA might not be reflective of my actual intelligence, but when I started, I, X, Y, and Z happened. I was taking some time to get accustomed to you know, college life being away from my family. And point us in the right direction, but if you look, in my last two semesters, I obtained straight A's, and I didn't take underwater basket weaving. I took you know, biology or something. Point us in the right direction. Show us exactly where you want us to go, because we will. We'll go back and look exactly where you're talking about. So I have a question, is that okay? <laughs> Just a follow up. So I do realize I'm a panelist, but I'm not a vision person. So, <laughs> so if, 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 if one of you can, um, you touched on this. So you mentioned if you, if you had a rough start. Um, so can you talk about um, what an addendum is and the uses for an addendum and how you would distinguish what would go in an addendum as opposed to what would go in a personal statement? And then a follow-up. Follow -up. We also have very high-reaching students who will think they need to write an addendum and write the kind of statement that you thought um, that you just mentioned if they have a 398. So mm -hmm. talk about what specifically would require a drop in grades and an addendum. That would be wonderful. Okay, so I can speak for uh, St. Thomas University. Basically, in addendum, we have two. So either you're going to do academic disciplinary or character and fitness issue. Ac academic and disciplinary is if you were placed on academic probation and you had a 2.0 or below, um, and if um, maybe you got caught cheating and you got placed on some type of suspension or something like that. You absolutely have to disclose that information to us. If you don't disclose it to us, it will come back full circle on the bar. And then in addition to that, we want to know what happened. Um, you know, explain it. And, and this is not the end all be all, really. It's just, this happened to me, uh, and I learned, and I've changed, and this is why. And then character and fitness is if you've been arrested or if you got an open container in the dorm, don't be afraid to disclose those things. Again, you absolutely have to. They're going to come back on the bar exam. But those are when the addendums are appropriate. So there, don't put an addendum if you drop below a 3.0. You got a 2.9 for a semester. That's not, we don't absolutely, you know, we don't need that. That's the difference at our university. And I'll just piggyback on that a second. You know, the general idea that trends do matter, trends are important, and we notice them. Uh, there may be some sort of trend in, in your grades that may not warrant an addendum. Uh, 
but we'll, we'll still take a look at it. And I think many of us, if not all of us, are, are mindful of it. You know? um, in, in our instance, we'd like to see and we'd rather see, uh, to the extent there is a trend, an upward trend, right? We understand that, again, many of you, maybe it's your first time away from home. You know, if you're from the South Florida area, and you want that in-state tuition, and you're going to FSU, or even the enemy is what are you after, whatever it is, it's your first time away from home, and, you know, the football means this, and homecoming that, and you make decisions as an 18, 19 year old that maybe aren't the most wise. And as you go on through your four years, um, you sort of put your head on the and you sort of get more serious and those sort of things. Um, we do notice that. You know, and, and obviously, to the extent there is a trend, we'd like to see that upward trend as opposed to the de evolution of the senior, where by the end, going through the motions and trying to get out of here. So I would summarize um, by saying um, generally, you don't have to explain a great performance. So if you got a 398 in GPA, please don't write an addendum explaining how great you were, right? Um, <laughs> you messed up with that 1B plus. Right, right. Um, don't, please. Um, um, and, and the same is true of the LSAT. If your LSAT places you in the top 25% of that school's uh, uh, LSAT scores, then you don't have to explain that. But the other side of that is, if, if it's lower uh, in either of those two, then you may want to provide an explanation. And, and then things, um, things like, I'm not a great test taker, um, it's probably not going to be very helpful, right? Because the way you get through law school is through exams and doing well on them. So if you're not a great test taker, are you sure you want to go to law school? Because <laughs> we're just going to give you more of <laughs> Um, and so, and so, uh, having some some explanation for why you the chances of your success in law school, despite a a poor indicator, is uh, the fodder that you want to include in your uh, in your identity. I would say this kind of goes back to what I was saying about maximizing the opportunities that you have to talk about yourself in the application. So if there's any I always say, if there's anything negative that you feel like you need to explain, then that's the personal statement. It's not the appropriate place to like, like a grade or a bad semester or a bad year or these extreme kind of things. So, so again, reading the directions, see what we accept. Um, and then if, if there is something you need to explain, explaining it appropriately in, the, in what we accept. But another thing that people ask about is withdrawals. I withdrew from a class. Do I need to explain? Like, one withdrawal from one class, like one semester is not a huge deal. Now, if you had to withdraw from an entire semester, then we would probably be more quizzing what happened here, you know, and, and maybe you'd want to include that. If you're a serial withdrawal, <laughs> well, we might need to have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I had a question, um, work experience versus campus involvement. One of my big things is that I'm very involved on campus, but because of that, I haven't had any work experience because I'm afraid my GPA will drop, I won't perform as well in my classes. I was just wondering your advice on that. What would look more competitive on an application? Should I keep getting involved more involved on campus, or should I try to find work experience instead? What would you recommend? I have a question for you. Were you at the game on Saturday? Your voice. Yes, I was. <laughs> it all can demonstrate positive attributes that are going to help your application. If you were working to gain experience because you don't know lawyers and you want to see how a law firm works, but so that you're making educated choices about career and about wanting to do this crazy thing called law school, but that's great. You're involved in campus because you're a leader. That's another good quality. So it's 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 how and who you are, uh, and I don't think you should change that. I, I used to say, if you don't like old people, and you heard it was good to volunteer in a nursing home, 
please don't volunteer for my mother-in-law. I actually like her, and I don't want somebody helping her who doesn't like her. Uh, don't change who you are just because you're applying to law school. Take what you do and present that to us. And, and my buzzwords are this, we have an expression in my office, common sense. It ain't so common anymore. Just use common sense on this stuff. I don't care what you call all these different things. I don't care if you call it an addendum or a story or a sentence to explain something. The process isn't important. What is important is that you share with us who you are. You share with us the choices that you make and why that makes you a good candidate for law school and a career in law now. And I would argue you could do that equally well by working or by being involved in campus. And I'll add, I mean, just from my perspective, I prefer to see um, perspective of whether you go the work experience route, the you know, on-campus involvement in route, maybe a little bit of both, whatever it is. Um, but I, I, I like to see commitment and, and longevity with something. If, if you work at a law firm for three months just to put on the resume line, and then you were in this club for a semester, and then you did this, and then you did that, and it's just all sort of scattershot everywhere, that's not as compelling to me as someone who maybe had less involvement in terms of the things that they did and the breadth of their experience, uh, but they were more committed in the fewer things that they did. Uh, things because you have to be committed to succeed in law school and in the profession. I like the way you phrased the question because it shows the counterbalance between work experience versus student activities, but not at the expense of GPA. And I get that a lot where students um, want to defend a lower GPA by, by pointing me to all of the great things they're involved in. And I think in that, um, in that situation, the student paid too much for their involvement if it came at the expense of a, uh, a GPA or um, LSAT score. So um, as long as that's the counterbalance, then I agree. I don't think you can really go wrong there if you're pursuing something that you really are interested in and, um, and it shows a track record of interest in a particular area. Um, the, other, the other side of it is the, um, the junior or senior who joined like five organizations were leader in none of them but they got all these things listed on their resume that's really paper thin it's easily seen yeah it's definitely quality over quantity in that in that case and i just going to reiterate which is the emphasis on leadership uh, whether it's in your job position whether you're taking initiative in your job description you're able to say this is what i've done or with the, the student organizations or whatever organization uh, community service and just showing that that commitment, I like the word um, commitment, and, and really emphasizing how you've been able to make an impact with this particular organization, showing that you have initiative. And yeah, I'd rather see one major organization that you really committed to it. You have a, you know, either you're a chair of a committee or a, an officer with the organization rather than someone with 10 organizations and absolutely no, you know, it's not really showing that depth. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have a question, Mike? Yes. Um, okay, so I've heard, is, is there any truth to this that in law school, if you can make it through the first year of law school, then your chances are that you can definitely make it through the next two or three years? And secondly, um, what are the tips for transition from college to law school? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So your first year is absolutely grueling, right? It's tough. It's like nothing you've ever done in your life. Uh, I wish I would have applied myself as much as I did in law school as I did in undergrad because I never realized that I had the capacity, really my brain had the capacity to absorb so much information. Um, memorizing things aren't going to help you. So if, you, if you're a crammer, right, the night before the exam, you can memorize a bunch of stuff and get by. That won't help you in law school, absolutely not. It's from day one to the exam. You are studying every day, multiple hours a day, and in between. I would listen to CDs in my car. That's that, you know? <laughs> um, so that is completely different. As for the first year, it's tough, and you learn a lot about yourself, and you're going to make some of your best friends in your whole life right then and there. Um, 
but that doesn't mean that if you let up once you once you com successfully complete that first year, that doesn't if, if you just say, oh, I'm too good, you know, I got this, uh, you absolutely at that point could be dismissed or fail out at that point. Yes. So no, I wouldn't say just because you made it through your first year that means you're smooth sailing. It's nothing like that. I think um, a former attorney that I used to work for he said the first year they scare you, the first year they work you to death. The second year, they scare you to death, and the third year, they bore you to death. Mm -hmm. That's the best uh, analogy that I've heard in reference to it. I don't know how the faculty would feel about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, um, it, it's a transition that you really need to be mentally prepared for. And your undergraduate experience does not always prepare you for exactly what you will see in law school. It is another level. And from, from that um, standpoint, it's important to um, learn what you can from others who are going through that experience, uh, but, but it's, it's probably going to be even worse than what you um, Well, and, and I say that, I say that because, because it's, one thing, it's one thing when you hear somebody say, um, oh, it took all my time. It's another thing when it's all your time. Okay. <laughs> And, and you absolutely cannot go and spend time with your family, or you cannot go to this thing that you really want to go to because your studies come first. Um, and I think having that, um, having that experience, nothing really prepares you for going through it like going through it. Um, and then the other thing I, I, um, I wanted to share about the law school experience, I just forgot, so. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I like to really emphasize uh, in terms of the difference from undergraduates is that law school is more of a pursuit. Like, it's a lot more work in terms of learning. It's not just opening a book and saying, okay, I'm about to learn this right now. That's not how it works. It's, a, it's a more of a marathon, okay? Um, you can't, again, like, um, uh, like my colleague was saying, you can't necessarily learn everything in one night or one week. It's a going, you're building on top of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. You're learning a new way of thinking, a new way of analyzing things. It gets to a point where you're watching a crime movie and you're just like, that's not making any sense. That's not real. That's not how it works. <laughs> and so you really change the way you think. When you're having conversations with people, you start having the both sides of arguments forming in your head. And it could be with a spouse. It can, just don't do it too much with a spouse. It's not going to be good. But it, is, it, it really does kind of change the way you think or see things in, in, in different arguments and in different situations. And so it's more of a pursuit. And so some people it doesn't click during the first semester. It clicks during the second semester. But make sure that it's something that you're continuously pursuing and that you're engaging your entire campus, all the resources to make sure that you have it down. Two things that I got up when I entered law school. Uh, the first is the sheer volume of the work. To go to your question about the transition from undergrad to law school, what is the sheer volume of the work? Specifically, the reading. Uh, because the reading and the digestion of the reading really is the work in law school. Uh, we're talking about exams, and if you're not a good test taker,